Ladies and gentlemen, America's latest success story, the Partridge family. Welcome, everyone, to Facebook Live at When We're Singing. I'm Johnny Ray Miller here, just a little light. How oh, do you want to grab that light and turn it out there? Technical. <laughs> Welcome to the 50th anniversary of the Partridge family. Uh, it has been a, a long road for 50 years, but I'm so happy that we are all here together again. And uh, before we get going, I'd like to bring on a friend of mine. Uh, his name is Michael Pomerico. He is our director this evening. I met Michael along the way, and uh, hey, Michael. Hey, Johnny, how are you? We finally got you on board. What's that? We finally got you on board the bus. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, technology, you got to love it. Yeah, yeah. Well, but, whenever you're ready to get started, boss, we're ready. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think, I think we're ready to go. Okay. I'm excited to see Shirley and everybody. So here we are, 50 years since the Partridge family premiered. The 60s were a time of turbulence and uh, a time where America needed a break when the decade came to an end and the Partridge family was the perfect break for us. Uh, here we are, 50 years later, it is the exact same time, the exact same day, and the exact minute that the Partridge family first premiered. Uh, so fortunate to have so many people here with us tonight. Uh, first up, I, I want to uh, talk about my favorite lady in all of this, uh, Shirley Jones. Shirley was an Oscar-winning actress, and um, she came to us on The Partridge Family as a star from Broadway. Um, uh, the famous work she did with Rodgers and Hammerstein, and everyone told her that um, doing a TV series was not the thing to do, but she did it anyway. Um, Shirley's going to be with us here for a short time, so we want to use our time wisely and bring her on as quick as we can. Uh, Shirley? Hello. Hi, Shirley! I'm going to fix my light here. It's too bright. There we go. How are you? I'm good, I'm happy to say. Oh, me too. I'm so thrilled to see you. Nice to see you, Johnny. You look wonderful. Thank you. So uh, you started out uh, in the musical business. Oh, yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Your your uh, first uh, works were Oklahoma mm -hmm. and Absolutely. Carousel and Music Man. And uh, so many Partridge Family fans forget that you are that you started in the movies. Yes, exactly. That was how Rogers and Hammerstein were very, very uh, pleased with you, I understand. <laughs> Wonderful. Yes, I was under personal contract to them, you know. Yeah, I know. And weren't you the only one? Only one. Yeah, that is um, yeah. That is quite an accomplishment. Yeah, it was wonderful. So, what, can you believe it's been 50 years since the Partridge family? No, I can't. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know. As fans, uh, we're thrilled that you're here with us uh, nice 50 years later, there. still still riding on the bus. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, my lighting is crazy, isn't it? <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, hey, I just wanted to uh, talk to you about a couple of things here before we bring everyone else on. You you were uh, invited to be Mrs. Brady, weren't you? Yes. Uh -huh. And you turned that down. Yes, yes, I did. <laughs> I think I'm not, uh, the... I'm not sure, exactly sure why I turned it down, but I think <laughs> time. I wasn't yeah. to, to, to do it, you know. Yeah, I know. The Partridge family was so much more suitable for you. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. It, it had music. And yeah, that's, uh, the, that's the reason, I'm sure. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Well, we're certainly glad that you did. Uh, we're very lucky to have you. Um, we're going to bring on the rest of the cast so that they can all say hello. Oh, and that's nice. uh, after we bring them on, we have a very special little tribute surprise for you. 
Oh, good. <laughs> yes. Okay. So can we bring on Danny Bonaducci, Brian Forster, Jeremy Gelbwax, Danny, oh, hey. Ricky Seagal, Seagal. Sorry about that, Rick. Hey, Jeremy. Good to see you. Rick. Is everybody here? <laughs> We're getting there. We have Bruce Kimmel. All right. Hey, Bruce. Hi, Bruce. And we have Henry Dill, legendary photographer, and Ann Moses, Tiger Beat editor during the time of the Partridge family. Hello. Hey, uh, before Hello. I talk to Jones, how glad I am she's here. What the hell are we doing looking like the Brady Bunch? Oh, my God. I'm <laughs> <laughs> What's this about? <laughs> Bob, can you turn the lights down just a little? I'm out here. Ah, look, he's got it. <laughs> hey, Shirley, you look beautiful as always. No, it's oh. Hollywood Squares. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. So good to Am see I you. Paul Lynn? Just so you know. <laughs> Depends on your uh, comedic ability, right? And he was the best. Yeah. So we yeah. have a very special. Yes, uh, you are. We have a very special clip here we want to show in honor of Shirley. Shirley, we got a clip of you singing the whale song from the Partridge Family. Oh, wow. I love that. Yeah. You. Whale song, soft and low. Sing me a story as gently you go. Whale song, I hear what you say. This may be the last time you're passing this way. Oh, wow. wow. How is, how's that for a blast from the past? Oh, wow. Oh, I love that. You know, I, live really the in, uh, I live here in the Pacific Northwest, so there's whale stories all the time. And when we have one, we play that song all the time on that morning. <laughs> Great. Oh. You know, Shirley, that song uh, is one of the fan favorites. It's one of the songs that everyone talks about and they yeah. that it was uh, out there, you know, for availability, but it never made a release. I know. I know it didn't. I know. I know. Yeah. I oh, just fans that. just, it was perfect for you. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, we wish that uh, we wish we had a copy of that on record. I know. Me too. <laughs> so, Danny, what? Yeah. What um what do you value most about Shirley? About Shirley Jones? Yeah, I, that's easy. You know, I'd be easy to kid here and everything, but I'm not gonna. Um, my uh, my family life was a little brusque for a ten year old kid, and <laughs> Shirley took it upon herself to sometimes bring me to her home for the weekend, and I didn't even uh, realize what was happening at the time, and then it bothered me. So you know, I may be sixty years old, but I'm not too late to say thank you, Shirley. Oh, darling, I love you, and I love having you. You were like one of my children. I, I know it was. <laughs> Brian, Brian, what's your best memory of Shirley? Oh, did we lose Brian? Oh, Brian got disconnected. Yeah, Brian got disconnected, Johnny. Oh, okay. Oh, Jeremy, Jeremy, you were really young during this. Uh, what What is your your most famous memory of Shirley Jones? I was very young, in fact, and um, <laughs> memory, <no. laughs> like, uh, but uh, what can I say? I thought that um, it, it was great fun, really, to be around Shirley. I, I thought she uh, she had infinite patience, shall we say? And uh, sure. you know, for me, this was it was really my first and, in fact, only acting job, and yeah. you know, so I was. Uh, uh, it was uh, it was Shirley and and Danny and and yeah. Dave uh, and David who helped help me you know be something in that show and so yeah. I'm thankful to all of them for that. Yeah. Brian, Brian, you were the only one who actually had blonde hair. You're the only one that actually looks like you could be the child of Shirley Jones. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Michael. Well, can, can, uh, Brian, can, Brian and, can Brian and I both exist in the same universe? <laughs> so, uh, Brian, isn't that crazy? I think I, I. 
Oh, lost him again. I, I think it's a sign of some kind. <laughs> yeah, it could be. <laughs> Henry, what brought you to the Partridge family? Well, Tiger Beat Magazine, I think, and, and Ann Moses, yeah. I mean, one day, one day I got a call from Ralph Benner, the, the editor of Tiger Beat, and uh, I had worked a couple of years earlier doing The Monkees on their film set. And then the same phone call a couple of years later, Henry, we'd like to hire you for the day to go down to the, the, the Partridge family set and, you know, take photos all day. And uh, I went down to the first day I met David. And, uh, you know, we were, I mean, I was kind of a hippie and, and he was kind of a hippie. And then the photo I took of him early on, God, we, it it we became friends right away. And, uh, I mean, I must say, years after what? the family I went all around the world with David on his solo performances and, and got to see got so many great adventures seeing the world but I love being on the Partridge family every morning up you know treating photos so uh Shirley Shirley yes. it's been so much fun doing the Partridge family oh yes it was wonderful for me you know it gave me an opportunity to stay at home be with my kids and I loved the show. I loved doing it. I loved everybody in it. It was one of the best times of my life in the business, I think. Oh, that's so great to hear. Well, yeah, you, you are certainly America's favorite TV mom. There's no doubt about that. Thank you. And you had to keep that redhead in line. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Danny, Danny, you turned out pretty good, though. I mean, hey. All right. I did all right. Thank you, Shirley. <laughs> Rick, you were really, really young. What's, do you have any memories of Shirley? I do. Uh, I, I was really young, but I do have memories of Shirley, thanks to also pictures from the show that refresh the memory throughout the years. Yeah. Uh, but mm -hmm. and uh, I, Shirley and I had run into each other several years ago, just a brief passing, and every encounter I've ever had with Shirley in my memory, both as a little child and then the one a few years ago, is nothing but sweetness and kindness and graciousness. Oh, how nice. oh that is so nice to hear. Uh, Brian, can you hear us okay? He's, looks like technical difficulties there. Uh, we have... <laughs> We have a really great clip here of Brian and Shirley. I want to show it. It's from the episode about the hamsters. Michael, sure. clip. Mom, Mom, wake up. What's the matter? He wasn't the only Something's one. What's wrong with Dean Martin? He's sick. Oh, it's probably just a hangover. No, the hamster. He's in terrible pain. I'm afraid he's going to die. Well, he must have eaten something. What have you been feeding him? The same stuff we've been feeding him all week. Please come, Mom. Okay. <laughs> how's how's that for 50 years ago, huh? Boy. <laughs> Does everybody remember that uh, Dean Martin is a white hamster with red eyes? That's why we call him <laughs> Dean Martin. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> that is great. Yeah, I was saying earlier, Brian, you're the only one who actually looks like Shirley in the Partridge family with the blonde hair. Oh, he's gone again. Every time I say that, he's gone. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Bruce. Yes. Hey, so you were the most frequent guest star on the Partridge family. You were on there five times. Wow. Tell us about that fit. How are you such a good fit for the Partridge family? I have no idea. You know, I did the first one and it was great fun. I just fell in love with everybody on that show, especially Shirley and Susan and David and Danny and all of them. And uh, I don't know, two months later, they called and said, uh, we want you to come back. And I said, oh, okay. And it was a whole different character. And then they called again and said, we'd like you to come back. And it was a whole different character. <laughs> In the final season, and I was a different character. So I was a little schizophrenic. But I well, love Bruce, uh, doing Bruce this. Bruce I, uh, I, uh, I, I know that started off on Bewitched. You were on Bewitched, weren't you? Hey, Johnny, I don't mean to interrupt. No, nope. sorry you know, to interrupt you. Uh, yeah, uh, no problem. Hi, Michael. Hi there. We have to keep Shirley on her schedule. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. that's, that's right. We have to. Uh, we only had a short time with Shirley, and I wanted everybody to have a chance to uh, pay tribute to her. Wonderful seeing you, Shirley. You look beautiful as always. Johnny, thank you, Dan. It's so good to see everybody. I'm just so yeah. good to see everybody. Shirley, thank you. You look fabulous, darling. 
So do you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh. Shirley, thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. I'm glad you asked me to do it. I love, love seeing everybody. Yeah. Oh, that's so great to hear. Uh, well, you are and always will be America's favorite TV mom. Oh, thank you, Judy. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Shirley. Bye, Shirley. Bruce, back to you. So uh, you were talking about these uh, five appearances you had. Yeah, Danny, I think, asked about Bewitched. I wasn't on Bewitched. I did the pilot of uh, Tabitha, the first pilot. Oh, that's right. That's Adam, right. Her brother. And would you, like to know, would you like to know who tested for the role of Tabitha with me? It wasn't you, was it? Really? Oh. And she did not get it. Wow. Oh. <laughs> well, she was destined oh, for the Partridge family, right? It's good to see you, Danny. Yeah, nice to see you. So, Jeremy and Brian, I have a question for you guys. Did they teach you anything about the drums? Well, so I, I had drum lessons. I, I, I think the fellow who played the drums on the record was involved in that but um you know mostly i had drum lessons so that i could look like right. i was drumming in the 20 seconds of b-roll footage yeah. that i had to be in <laughs> 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 but uh that that was the extent of my musical career i must say did you, so you didn't uh, really get involved with music ever after that, huh? Uh, not as a performer, no. I, uh, I'm involved on the management side now, but not, uh, not as a performer, no. And you're pretty good friends with Susan Cowsill, of all people. I, I am. I, I, uh, my family, I moved with my family to, to New Orleans in 1990, and Susan and, uh, and her family had moved here shortly thereafter, and we met at some music event here in New Orleans and uh, have been friends ever since. Really, um, you know, Susan has a, has a thriving career here in New Orleans and, and touring still. And so wow. there you go. Just a weird coincidence you having to do with New Orleans. Hey, yeah. Connie, Connie, are you there? Brian, can you hear us? I'm trying to be. Hey, oh, there I is. can hear you, but it cuts in and out. I just sent a note off. Yeah. Okay. Ah, uh, John Baylor is destroyed. Yeah. Us. Well, don't count up for too long. I might right, right. be gone again. Okay. Hello. Uh, this is John Baylor, everybody. He was the vocal arranger and one of the real background vocalists for the Partridge Family. Hi, John. Hi, Welcome, there. John. Hey, John. Yeah. Yes. Are you responsible for this? I'll never forget it. Ba -da 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 -da. Ba -da 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 -da. That one. Did you do that? Yeah, I'm afraid so. <laughs> we were the only ones who were doing that. We were selling records and stuff, and we still had that kind of arrangement. You're the man. <laughs> Forced me to do that. Not sure. Danny, what was the lip syncing like trying to do that? Watch, watch any single episode, and you'll barely ever see me because <laughs> I don't know if I was being a jerk already, but I grew into it. I never knew the words for the songs ever. And I would kind of look at Susan Day and do whatever she was doing. And sometimes I would look at Brian or Jeremy and see what they were doing. But by that time, it was over. So uh, you'll never really see me doing too much on the musical numbers. <laughs> That's funny. Anne, a question for you. How did you get involved um, on the set of The Partridge Family and setting up the Tiger Beat magazine, uh, the Partridge Family official magazine? Well, the, the uh, Screen Gyms, showed it to my publisher, Chuck Lawfer, before it even aired. And he locked up the contracts to do the official Partridge Family Magazine and of course, special columns that were in Tiger Beat. So I was out on the set before it had even aired and, you know, beginning to do my work. Wow, what a great story. So did you ever work with Henry? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Henry, so, do you remember working with Anne? Oh, gosh, yeah, of course, yeah. And I mean, you know, when you work on a show like that, there's a lot of downtime while they set the next scene. Exactly. So, you know, Anne Moses would be there to interview the cast members and 
everybody and David, you know, especially David was on the cover of so many Tiger Beat magazines and the poster inside. And um, so we spent a good deal of time together hanging out. Yeah. John, how did you arrive at the right sound for the Partridge family? Interesting story. You got a minute? Um, actually, when we were called to do the pilot, we walked in and there was no arrangement for the background. So I had to write it on the spot, which I did. And um, while it sold, I got a phone call that the series was on. And um, so I was living in a one room apartment at the time. And uh, whenever I wasn't in the studio, I would close all the blinds, put on headphones, and I listened to the mamas and papas, the calcils, and uh, the Beach Boys. I'm trying to think of who else it was. I think it was just those three. And I just inundated myself with with the family sound. Um, did you watch the pilot, and did you have a feel for the feeling of the show and the style? Uh, no, no, not at all, because I didn't want to be influenced. I wanted to... I wanted to come up with a, a family sound that really sounded like a family. So I inundated myself with all of these groups. And then I put it away for a couple of weeks. And when I started writing, out came the Partridge family. And it, uh, by the first album, we already had it kind of down. And from then on, it was a piece of cake. We loved every minute. That's so fantastic. Hey, Johnny. Yes. Can people hear me right oh, now? Yeah. I, are you aware that our first record, I Think I Love You, knocked the Beatles out of first place on the Billboard charts? <laughs> yes. Isn't I that crazy? That. It, it did. did. Yeah. Yeah, it did. It did. In fact, so, it was weird that, that, um, that interlude in the middle, it was all voices. I had to write in the session. Maybe. Because there was nothing written for us. It was just a break. And the band was playing and nothing was going on. So we kind of did that vocal thing and that became one of our signatures. The, the music is me? so very Yeah, it's right, 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 right on. What's that? Brian asked if we could hear him. Yes. Yep. Yeah, I think I hear you, Brian. I see you. I first think I love you. First of all, I see, <laughs> I see Rick Siegel there. Ricky Siegel. Yes, sir. Hi, John. Hey, Ricky Siegel. Hey, hey. <laughs> many, many nights. Yep. You know, in those days, you and your mom and your dad. How are they? Are they still around? They are still around. In wow. fact, my dad's watching. Oh, good. Well, oh. hi, Ricky. Hi, Big Ricky. You know, your dad and I wrote a whole bunch of songs because your dad's nuts. You know that. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> certifiable. We wrote a whole bunch of songs for uh, Captain Kangaroo. Yes. Yeah, we did, and um, uh, and your dad came up with the lyrics like "I got a little lot of." I mean, come on, who would write that? Anyway, <laughs> just a side I'm, note. I'm cut. I'm cutting yeah. in and out. I'm having problems. Yes, yeah. you are. <laughs> Keep trying, Brian. We don't want to lose well, you. Yeah. Hey, uh, I got a, a question, there, Johnny. Yeah. yeah, you're doing a fabulous it's job. My syncopation uh, here. It's just not on cue. We haven't seen each other in forty years. Oh. Sorry about that. Brian interrupted there. What was that? I was just wondering when, when we can talk to each other, when we can say hi. Oh, man, I would love to. I would love to see you again, Danny. Okay. I just, Ricky's beautiful. You grew up so pretty. Look at this, man. I've been real hard to put away wet, but you look terrific. Danny, I think you've done better than you think. Well, I agree. I agree. Yeah, Rick did that for his mom. That's true. That's very true, John. So I haven't seen you in 50 full on years. How are you? I'm I'm good, Dan. I you know well, no, I saw you more recently than that. You were in Chicago, right? We all came. Oh to yeah, Chicago. yeah, yeah. You were on my very first daytime talk show, and more. There's been a few since. Ugh. Yeah, that was, but that was 25. Oh wow, that's 30 years ago. Easy. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Hey, so how are you built? Let me tell you, Mister. Uh, with all the craziness and sex and drugs and rock and roll that was going on around the set of the party, 
you were always the coolest guy. Everybody always wanted to be doing whatever the hell Henry Dilts was up to. And I remember you on the cruise ship, and you were cool on that. Yeah, it wasn't that fun. Or what? You know, <laughs> we, are gonna talk, we are going to talk about the cruise ship. Bruce Gimmel was on there, too. And yeah. we're, we got to show you the clip we put together. Our master yeah. genius, Michael Pomerico, has put Did together a fantastic clip. It's a oh, look at that. Wow. Oh, look at that. Oh yeah, my. Bruce, I remember you so oh, well. Yeah. Oh, yeah, look at that. Wow. Hey, wait, hold that up. I got to take a picture. Hold it up again, Bruce. Hold it up, <laughs> hold it up again, oh, yeah. Bruce. I want to get a picture of this in case it never happens again. Hang on. Everybody oh, smile. Yeah. I'm doing the same thing. Great. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> You know, real quick, uh, I thought of something, because uh, I know Danny did a Partridge Family show. I when, David did his, when, when David did his version of the Partridge Family, I think it had been 25 years, or, uh, I can't remember. And he wanted to hire the same band and record in the same studio and hire the same background singers. The only one that couldn't be there was Ron Hicklin, because he was in uh, Europe with his wife. Right. That's a that's a great album, by the way, too. Uh, David put that out in 2000, early hey, 2000. I never got paid for that. Oh, <laughs> man. You have David Cassidy's album for it, so I'm seeing. I should have asked David when it's done. It's fine. But what, what happened was uh, I, had, uh, I had opened up the arrangement in the booth. Of I think I love you, the background arrangement. And David came over and he was over my shoulder and said, God, wouldn't you love to know where the original is of this? And I said, this is the original. He said, no way. I said, my wife wow. recently at the oh, time. there's the guy. There's the man. <laughs> I have all David. My wife has all David's albums, man, and they're great. If you haven't listened to a David Cassidy album in, in many, many years, and I, that's probably the case, you should re-listen to them because they're fantastic. Oh, yeah. They are fantastic. He, uh, that guy has a voice um, like no other, and I say that all of the time. He is one of those people that needs to be remembered right up there with all the greats of that era because his voice is undeniably uh, indistinguishable from anyone else. And that was one of David's problems, that he didn't sound like anybody, and it really bummed wow. him out. And wow. I related to that because I felt the same way about me. So hmm. he and I used to talk about that, um, uh, and I wish he could – actually, later in life, he did – embrace the voice and the Partridge family, which I was grateful for. Yeah, I went on yeah. tour with David for a couple of years and he always did Partridge family songs and always closed with I Think I Love You. And he looked like I was uh, having a fantastic time. Yeah. Well, you know, let's talk about another really classic album. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah. Awesome. I do not know that I recorded something but when I look at it, I, I'm not sure my voice is on it. That is uh, the great Bruce Roberts that wrote most of those songs, played the piano, and overlapped my voice. That was, do you know, about 20 years ago or more, uh, the Bell Bottom Society of America, whoever they were, said they will give you a nickel and any album you want if you take away the Danny Bonaducci album. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. No, no. I missed that call, dude. Yeah, but now, but now you're going to pay several hundred for it on eBay, right? Yeah, right. absolutely. Hey, Rick, let's talk about this. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Look at that. Oh, my. How did that come to be? It's the Rick John, and Paul album. John probably knows better than I do. I just showed up and sang. Yeah, you did. We had fun doing that. That was yeah. really cool. But you were such a talented kid, with you, Bob beyond your years, you had no idea how good you were. <laughs> and you were good and good looking. Hey, Rick, I had a question for you. I yeah. heard you were a pastor or something, is that true? Many moons ago I was, yeah, a long, long time ago. Well, how did you quit that job? <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a particular season of my life when I had done that and uh, all the doors on that closed. I was in San Antonio, Texas at the time and then all the doors of coming back to LA and, and acting again and doing stuff in the industry just opened up and it was real clear that that season of my life just closed. I did that for like well, 10 years. Were you, were you any good at it? Cause that's the main, I go to church to this, you know, non-denomination, a lot of, lot of guitars and stuff like that. It's very fun. But my pastor's great. Were you good at it? That was my primary thing was worship leading. I, I led the songs before services with the guitar. So it was musical. How weird is that? One of us became yeah. a minister. 
Jeremy, I got a question for you. What do people say to you through the years? Do they remember you? Do they come up to you? People of a certain age will remember me, not, not if they see me, but if they see my name on something, right? It's, you, you know, there's a, there's not a lot of Jeremy Gelbwaxes in the United States. <laughs> <at> the <moment. laughs> now, when you certain... and I talked, when you and I talked before, you had a, a lot of memory of the pilot. Um, would you share some of that with us, the little bit you remember oh, shooting the pilot? Okay. But Johnny, we, you and I talked 10 years ago. I don't know. Uh, I don't remember what I told you 10 years ago, but we, uh, so uh, the pilot. So I, I have a, a memory of Las Vegas, the, 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 this, this non-exist, the sign that doesn't exist anymore that said the Partridge family on it. I remember a giant buffet in which I ate myself sick, I think, while in wearing red velvet costume, red velour uh, uh, jacket. Uh, you know, too long ago. Right. Anybody, anybody remember that uh, we were introduced by Johnny Cash? Oh yeah, that is possible. Yeah. Yeah. Thing I ever heard yeah, about. I, I saw <laughs> that on this. On this is a coincidence. I love that. Come on, Larry. Fun memories. Let's go. <laughs> Anna, question. May What's I that? ask Anna a question? Uh, yeah. Did you, uh, uh, you know, because the you weren't held up to a literary standard like say if you're going to publish a book. But was it easy? Did we give you enough material? And other pop stars, my kind of, we Did you get enough material to write every time you, you know, wanted a thousand words? You could get it easy. Well, uh, the secret to Tiger Beat was whenever we would do an interview, we had to take little bits and pieces from that interview. And from one sentence, like, you know, the worst day of my life was the day I fell in the mud or whatever the story was, that was turned into a three page story with pictures. So we really had to stretch the material because, I mean, we would have been interviewing you 24 seven because we had, you know, we had Fave Magazine, Partridge Family Magazine, Tiger Beat, and then our special little book. So, um, we really just had to make the best of everything we could draw out of every person we talk to. Well, you have, people have a good memory of you. When I do radio station premieres or any kind of premiere or show or anything like that, I would say I've signed a thousand Tiger Beat magazines, including recently. Oh, yeah. I love hearing that. That is so cool. cool. Henry, you came onto the scene in season two, actually. I did. <clears throat> How did all of it come to be that you got assigned to the Partridge family? Well, like I said, I had shot the monkeys a few years pre, you know, prior to that. And I think it's really because David and I got to be good friends right away, you know. And so that gave me a little more access. And I and I I tried not to be a pain in the ass photographer, you know. I didn't get <laughs> in your face. I tried to hang back and, you know, document and be a fly on the wall. And that worked really well. And and since I was a musician as well, David and I had stuff to talk about, you know, and then and we then after a while we had a lot of friends in common and you know, we went to Hawaii and and pretty soon all over the world. And and I I guess I was at every single David Cassidy uh, concert there ever was, you know. You were on the world and, tour, the record breaking world tour with him. I was and I played harmonica on one of the songs. Yeah. Oh, did you? Yeah. Oh man, that's so cool. Do you remember do you remember Melbourne and Wembley? I do. I remember all that. The main thing, I mean, I would always be on the stage because you couldn't get in the audience. It was packed with packed yeah. girls. And so from the stage you'd look down and you'd see the security guard pulling girls out of the crowd where they were getting smashed in there by the surging crowd. And it was uh, it was incredible. It was amazing. They had to stop the concert a few times and say, "Get back, everybody, move back, or we'll have to stop." You know. Well, See, you know the um, the power of the TV show to perpetuate that music, and then the talent of David Cassidy just made the phenomenon grow and grow and grow, and his popularity just kept getting bigger and bigger. Um, you know, that show, the show touched the hearts of so many people. You know, the Partridge family, it actually crossed a lot of um, uh, social issues. There were a lot of episodes on there that tackled social issues in a light, warm, friendly way. Danny, we got a great one you uh, we want to show you. Michael, right. yeah, let's show him the clip from Soul Club. This is just a... 
Excuse me, sir. <laughs> Danny Partridge is the name. <laughs> the reason I'm here is because we're having a block party for the Simon Brothers. We hope to save the club from financial fiasco. But if we don't, we're gonna go down the flames. I saw you were a cultural club, so I thought you might know where we can find some violin players. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you guys remember this or not, but uh, Lou Gossett Jr., back when he had hair, was on that show. <laughs> yes. And who was Richard, Richard Pryor was on Richard that. Pryor. Come on. Wow. wow. You remember that. I remember the song Bandala, wasn't it Bandala? Bandala, my love. That's it. That yes. was a West Farrell made it up in the, the on the spot. <laughs> wow. The first song and call it Bandala. You know, that particular episode is, uh, it was ranked by TV Guide as one of the greatest TV episodes of all time. Really? Yeah. Great episode. That's awesome. My son just texted me, Ricky, and wants me to ask you about Say Hey Willie. <laughs> well, what about Say Hey Willie? Do you remember it? <laughs> Absolutely, I remember it. In fact, I have repeatedly over the years uh, played songs to friends and different people throughout my life. And uh, I, I remember every word of most of the songs that were sung on the show or sung on the album, yeah. Well, I should slap you. I can't remember my name. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I'm I think it went a little something like this. Say, hey, what do they want to hit one out here? Uh, uh, yes. That's it. I'm on fire for this little audition. <laughs> Which song do they remember the most? What do the people say to you when they come up to you about the Partridge family? It's almost always it's sooner or later. And that, that was okay. the song I sang. Yeah, on the very, the, in fact, I have a little piece of, this is the script for the very first episode of the Partridge family I was on. Oh, oh cool. Yeah, and the very last thing, which closed out the episode before the tag, was me singing sooner or later, and then all the words for it are right there. There's sooner or later on the back of the script. That's amazing. Wow. Keep that. That is so cool. No, wow. cool. isn't that incredible? Yeah, it is. Wow. Um, can I ask Ann a question? Ann? Yes. Um, I was, I was in Tiger Beat somewhere around that time. And it's the only picture of me with long hair. What are the chances of me getting a copy of it? <laughs> uh, what, what year? Oh, God. <laughs> was, it, was it 73 or 74? Yeah, I was between marriages. So, yeah, it would be about right. <laughs> well, I only have through 72. But Sharon Lee, who was the editor of the Partridge Family magazine, I was the feature editor. And she has every copy. Wow. So I will. Wow. She yeah. has them in her New York apartment. And how that's possible, I don't know. But um, I will check with her and Thank you. She I, find I was in tight okay. feet and I had long hair. I just remember that. I don't well, know. That would be a great memory picture, wouldn't it? I don't know if I was Bachelor of the Month or what the heck it was. But I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you were in there for being a teen idol. No offense. No, I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, you're back. There he is. Where is he? I don't see him. I see him, but I, I don't hear him. I see him, but I don't hear him. Well, sort sort of. It keeps breaking up. We're, it, hmm. Our internet. Had a, hey, take this time to say something fascinating. Go! <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm better, better not heard, I guess. <laughs> Hey, Brian, I got a question for you if you can squeeze it in. Yeah, it throws up again on us, didn't it? Like so, Bruce, I, uh, Bruce, can I, I, want to to I got a clip here, Bruce, of all five of your appearances. Uh, we no, want to take uh, the Bruce Kimmel collage. Uh, oh, dear. Freddie, Laurie's date. How you do? I'm Laurie's mother. I'll have her home early. Okay. Hello, Mrs. Partridge. Hello, Marvin. Is uh, is Laurie here? No, she isn't. It's been nice talking to you, Richard. <laughs> Boy, you get me talking about sports, I can't stop. Oh, Mom, you've met Richard Whipple. Yes, hello, Richard. How are you? Fine. Richard's going to help me babysit while you're gone. You see, I'm the school treasurer, and the uh, books don't balance. My name is Wainwright, Howard Wainwright, the third. I'm Laurie Partridge. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, man. That's great. 
<laughs> yeah, do, you guys, do you guys remember being on the ship? Yeah. Who are you talking to? All of you. Henry, you yeah. went on, I on, on Danny, did you cause trouble on the ship? <laughs> I did. I got in a lot of trouble on that boat. Uh, I, I told a waitress in the bar that I wanted a seven and seven, and she said I couldn't have one because I was 12. And I said, we are in international water, and you are legally <laughs> responsible for serving me drinks. If you wouldn't do it, I would step back in the bar. And when somebody would get up and go to the bathroom, I would drink their drink real quick, and I stopped. And I picked up a black children and had cigarette butts. And that was not happen. Yes, I got in trouble on that boat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to see you haven't changed, Danny. Yeah. Was, yeah, it's such a Danny story. <laughs> I love that. Hey, 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 uh, Henry, do you remember taking a picture of me on that boat? Uh, if you're easily offended, don't look. Doing this. That ended up in the famous calendar with Johnny Cash. I was going to say, it's Johnny Cash. Yeah, I'm going to put that in my book of one finger salute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that picture, Danny. I put that in all my books. Do you guys remember? Hello? Who's talking? Do you guys Was that Brian? What Bruce. two actors were on the boat? I'm starting to think Brian's who were vacationing and thought they were getting out of Hollywood and had to improve. Do you remember? What is James you Franciscus and, uh, and John Lupton. Brought that boat, I and I went and apologized to them for disrupting their vacation. That trip was so wild in so many ways. So, wild. Yeah, so much, so much fun. So, Bruce, can you hear me? Oh, this is good. I'm sorry you can't hear me. <laughs> yes. There were rumors going around the set of the Partridge Challenge that no, he was going to replace David Cassidy. But it was a big deal. People were crazy. And he was going to what? Replace David. No, <laughs> Bruce, it wasn't the real thing, as far as I understand. It was David was starting to realize how rich and famous he was, and starting to be, you know, act like a movie star. So somebody started the rumor that Bruce was going to replace him. So he straightened up, and that did not work. <laughs> I did not. Have oh, enough, I did not have enough air to replace him. <laughs> yeah, you did. Yeah. Ricky had the hair. Ricky, they tried with Ricky, right? Yeah, well, not to replace David. No, but no, frankly, nobody yeah. could replace David. But yeah, I tried, I I had... tried the hair on the first episode. If you, <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's Ricky, everybody uh, wanted David's hair. Everybody wanted David Cassidy's hair. That right? is so true. And everybody <laughs> just had to wear it too, even those who probably shouldn't be trying. <laughs> Ricky, what do I you tried. I, in the first, if you look at my first episode, I've got my hair in the middle and down. Yeah. So stupid. Okay. No, it was a reasonable rumor. <laughs> <laughs> Ricky, what do you remember about um, the first episode? Your, do you have any memories of that? You were so little. I was, but uh, ironically, I really do have one of my most vivid memories from childhood is the first day on Partridge Family. And I remember being at the, the door that was where I was supposed to come into the garage. And there was a little red light that was the cue light. And I remember standing behind that door waiting for the cue light while everybody in the garage was singing and doing their thing. And when that light went on, it was my cue to walk in. And for some reason, that memory is like photographically stuck in my head. Wow. Uh, I also have a memory, Danny. I don't know if this was my imagination or someone said it because was there ever a show that had a monkey on it, or did you bring a monkey to set? Good question, man. Uh, I'll tell you what you're talking about, Bewitched. I did two episodes of Bewitched, one with a monkey. I don't think I brought a monkey to the set of the party. Right? Okay. All went, right. went a little hazy for me on episode three. <laughs> a few years ago, my wife found all of the Partridge uh, vocal arrangements that I did. No kidding. Wow. Yeah, I have all of them. Wow. They're for sale. No, I'm kidding. I, I won't say it. I won't tell well, I've got a question about the music, John. Um, this album here, the part, see if I get my glare off here. Um, the Partridge Family Sound Magazine is considered the high point for the Partridge Family, and the sound had evolved by then. Can you talk a little bit about how that sound evolved? Well, I think it was just, um, 
It was partly us seeing together more and more and more, and partly us seeing the show. Because Sally or Jackie uh, Ward sang the really high part, and I was the next youngest kid. And then Ron Hicklin was the next youngest kid, and my brother was the teenage bass, we called him. And um, wow. so just seeing so much and getting used to the style, the arrangements, and the family, and all of that. I think it was the Sound Magazine that we did the whole album in one day. Are um, you kidding me? We did 13 sides in like six hours or something like that. Wow. That is crazy. But you had the sound so refined by then, and you knew exactly what you wanted. Yeah, we did. And pretty much every song that was written for the, for the family uh, really just for family. So it was really easy to do the backgrounds, for me anyway. It was really easy. All of them, there were a couple that... Uh, that weren't necessarily divinely inspired, but uh, those are the ones where Wes would say, no, 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 here's what I want you to do. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> he couldn't sing, so, and that's when I come out and I go, okay, fine. And I go out and tell the singers that I'd write something out, and Wes would say, that's it, that's it, that's what I meant. Wes Farrell was a genius. He had an ear like no other. Yeah, he was a that yeah, I, he started Chelsea Records, uh, and uh, I went to work for him as a head of production. So I was there for several years and, until we lost um, the guy that was the marketing guy, the guy that called radio stations to play my record or uh, kill you. Right, that guy. And uh, he was 36 years old, and he was having dinner with the head of publishing at his house, and he just dropped in his plate. He was gone. And the record company was never the same after that. Within a year, it was, it was, it was You know, we lost Tony Romeo, who yeah, was a songwriting that. genius, and Wes Farrell within like six months of each other in the 90s. I didn't know that. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, uh, actually, Wes Farrell was talking to David again in the 90s, and they actually had a conversation about working together again. Oh, wow. Mm. The, last year, the last year... I produced David on every song. He wouldn't sing for Wes. They weren't really happy with each other for whatever reason. Oh, well, I know what it was. David wanted to be a, a black singer. Wes wanted him to do Parker. Yeah, David wanted to evolve the sound uh, sooner than it could evolve. But, you know, I got to say, by the last album, there's 10 Partridge Family albums and eight of our studio albums. And the last album, the sound is different. It's really, it sounds more um, like the David Cassidy sound that evolved in the mid 70s. Yep, absolutely. And like I said, I, I produced him on that whole album because he, he would only sing for me, so. The session player list is crazy with credits. I mean, these guys were, um, you know, the top notch singers and songwriters of the day, the record mm -hmm. guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, they were the best. I mean, you know, like David, would say on stage, he said, I learned from the very best. And he did. Henry and Ann, I got a question for you. How um, the marketing image, the image that was David Cassidy out there uh, versus who he really was, and true for the Partridge family, how, um, how ingrained do you think that is with the public, even 50 years later? Well, uh, <laughs> Well, everybody, I mean, he had a great face, you know. And I mean, I spent hours looking at his face framed up like that, you know. It was so familiar to me, you know. When I'd raise the camera, there it was. There was that face. And it was so easy to photograph, you know. And at lunchtime, when there'd be a lunch break for an hour, we'd go out and walk around the lot and do do portraits for the magazine. You know, and he'd change shirts and we'd do more portraits and... And so I, I just photographed him so much. I mean, he looked he looked the same, basically, all the time I knew him. He had that great face, you know? Yeah. There's a good chance David Cassidy was the most beautiful man in the world. I mean that sincerely. Nobody yeah. looks like David Cassidy. Was. That's what all his fans would say, for sure, and his smile. But the, the really uh, neat thing when, <clears throat> when Henry came on board was – he he and David did have that rapport, right. and so he, he got the shots of really the most relaxed David there could be because he 
he just felt, you know, I'm with my bud here. And he wasn't, basically, he wasn't having to perform for you. He wasn't having to, you know, turn and do this and do that. He just would be his, himself. And then, and then you, those were the best shots always. So that, that really contributed to the things that, that Henry shot for us. They yeah. are not sing That's nor play an instrument on the um, on the parts of records. Imagine why. I think I love you. They said, no, you can't do that on these records. But I'll tell you, this <laughs> magazine reminded me. Uh, my wife and I go to vintage record shops all the time, and I have all the parts of the album. And we invented this new game. Oh, I love this. The album, I sign them and put them back and wait for people to find them. Oh, yeah, it's turned into a whole thing. I've done it all around the world. Uh, and I always want to say what area or state it's in, and people find it every time. It, it's like, well, my, mom, my wife came out with it. It's the coolest thing I've ever been involved. That's great. Right? That's, that's so, a great idea. So cool. You can see Danny doing this on Twitter. It is so funny. Those videos oh, yeah. are so funny. <laughs> I love it. That's great. Wow. Ricky, maybe that's what you should do. Uh, go hunt for your album in record stores and secretly I am. Find it. I am absolutely going to steal that idea, Danny, because I have found it in album stores, and I I will absolutely do that. That's a great <laughs> idea. Very fun. Yes. Yeah. Great. That is awesome. Hey, Brian, can you hear us? <laughs> this is almost like a gag. Johnny, Johnny, you I'm need to you I've got this great it. clip. I've been waiting to play this great clip, but I'm going to throw it out there because I think he can see it. So, uh, Michael, will you play the clip of De of uh, Brian and Suzanne in the episode where they run away from home? Oh, I remember that, yeah. She's not even worried. Let's really run away. Okay, let's do it. Boy, it's dark out there. I have a better plan. Let's run away in the morning, after we've had a good night's sleep. <laughs> oh, it's great. And, oh, and he's, he's, he's gone. gone. He's gone. Yeah. Hey, Johnny, you keep, calling, yeah. you keep calling him Brian, and the name under his face there says Chris. He put his name in as Chris Partridge. Oh. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Thank you. It is, it is funny. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I don't know what the hell is happening with Bruce Kimmel. Have a talk there he is. Now, man. What's up? Yeah. Bruce, I want to talk about that. I keep trying to talk about this cruise ship. You guys, so many of you were on it. Henry went and Bruce went and Danny was there. Uh, that cruise ship, how many days were you out there? Go with the grown up at the time, Henry. I, Five or six, seven, something like eight, that. Eight. I remember dinner. Dinner time was the most fun. They were you know, they, David and Susan, and you know we'd sit around the table and talk and have fun. And look at there's the uh, cinematographer guy. I don't remember all their names. Yeah, love that shot. Yeah, yeah, cool. That was great fun, man. That was we, fun. Yeah, we. I got to cruise up to Acapulco before they came on board. Uh, Ruth Gillette and I and William Zucker cruised up. We all got a free cruise huh. up to Acapulco, and then they all came on board. And I think we shot five days going back. To LA. Five days. But wow. uh, I those dinners, that. Henry. I remember the dinners. Like I have all my my menus. <laughs> <laughs> TSS Pharisee. Yeah. Have, I just remember David one night at dinner said, who's going back to whose cabin with who? And I threw my room key to Susan Day. And, uh, <laughs> room, man. <laughs> yeah. and went back to my cabin alone. <laughs> Never stop Bruce. How did the Partridge family influence all of your careers? Uh, Danny. Well, uh, I finished doing uh, the part of the family, went to high school, and then became a drug addict for about 20 years. <laughs> I had no fuel for that. Uh, and then, like, literally, there's a whole bunch of drama that happens, and I get a couple of my very own talk shows. But uh, I, I was in Chicago doing an interview about being the guy from the part of the family, and, uh, and this is like 30 years ago. 
And I had done a hundred of these interviews. And uh, finally, I did this interview with a guy named Jonathan Brandmeier, a huge disc jockey in Chicago. When I was done, his boss came and said, you know, you're very good at that. Would you like to stay? And I said, yeah. And he offered me, you know, not a great deal of money, but a fair amount of money. Would that be okay? And I thought, I was living in my car yesterday. Yes, that amount of money will do. And I've been on the radio every day for the last 30 years. Well, that is such a great point, You know, people might find that as a, an insult to me in six years old. Say you wouldn't be on the radio if you weren't Danny Parker. Fine, yeah. Give the wheel down the money right here, and you can say whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah. Danny, I always love watching you in interviews because you are so genuine, so sincere, and you just come off. Uh, you know, uh, it's so truthful and so honest, and you're just the kind of guy that you just want to hang out with and have a drink. I mean, <laughs> Well, anytime, man. <laughs> Rick, how about you? How did it influence your uh, career post Partridge? Oh, man, it's everything I ever did after that was because of the Partridge family. I, I, I grew up as a child actor in the industry uh, and just kept working all the way through into my teens. And then I went into theater. So uh, everything I ever did thereafter is because of the Partridge family. And it also, it, yeah, and it also allowed me, I, I, I actually have a dream if I can make it to 104 years old, I'll be the first SAG member to hold a membership for 100 years. Wow. <laughs> oh, wow. That's, that's a great. little thing right there. Yeah. Wow. There you go. And that, that's because of the Partridge family. Stay on the treadmill, man. Yeah. <laughs> Bruce, how about you? I, you know, I uh, continued to act for many years and then got out of that end of the business. I became a director and a writer. And then uh, I had the, was given this op incredible opportunity to become a record producer, uh, which I grabbed in 1993. And I was nominated for two Grammys in 94. And it was, th that was, that ride was incredible and continues. I have my own record label now. And I did a lot of Broadway cast albums and off-Broadway and singers and... Mm. And I, it's just been incredible. And I've written 20 books, which I love doing. And uh, keep busy. That's know, fantastic. Busy. Wow. Yeah. John, you did so many vocals for so huh? many artists. Where does the Partridge family rank for you in all of that? Oh, well, yeah, that's so difficult because we did everybody. We were the monkeys. We were the Brady Bunch. We were, oh, um, <laughs> we were the Union Gap. We were... We were uh, we were a lot of people, and it, it, we were just we were blue collar singers. I mean, we just were background singers. That's what we did. People heard us all the time. Didn't know who we were. Still don't. Um, although now, you know, I'll be eighty in in November. Uh, right now, I have more fans because of Facebook uh, all over the world. Uh, wow! Really amazing. At the time, nobody knew who we were, which was fine. I mean, that that's, was our job. You know, pe people used to say, well, doesn't it make you mad that the that the star singer <laughs> the royalties and all of that? And my brother and I would say, no, we're still working. Where are they? <laughs> right. You know, I think talent lives on, and both the television show and the music live on because of the talent on screen and on those records. Uh, it's just undeniable that music is that music of the Partridge family. It's it's rooted in an easy listening sound, isn't it? But yet marketed like bubblegum. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And, I tried things arranging wise with the Partridge family that I never would have tried on any rock and roll record. But it just the songs lent themselves to certain certain things that I could I could try that I wouldn't necessarily try on somebody else's record. And it always worked. Henry, um, how often do people ask you about the Partridge family and working on the cinematography there? Well, they ask me about David a lot, you know, um, more. I mean, I would say, I, I'm not so sure how much it influenced my photographic career because it was really more in, you know, the Eagles and Crosby, wow. Still, Matt. And, and those people that I went on to photograph, but um, it was traveling the world with David, really, for a couple of years, and the adventure of that, and all the people I met in so many countries that are still friends of mine, you know, 
And I'm still meeting people. You, Johnny, you and I are good friends now. You know? Yeah. Uh, and I mean, you weren't even around. I didn't know you back then. Were, were, were you alive in the Partridge Family Day? Were you, were you, you were alive in the Partridge Family Day? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny. I was five years old when it premiered. Ah, there you go. Yeah. I didn't find it till about, I think it went into reruns in the fourth season. And that's when I discovered it. And yeah. I fell in love with it like every other little kid. But the thing that stayed with me all through the years was that music. I had all those albums. I kept playing the music. And I kept it brought me back to it. And yeah. then, you know, I kind of I can't believe I'm sitting here talking to all of you. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe it either. <laughs> well, it's happening. <laughs> My wife was born in 82. And when I oh. met she wasn't even live on the part of the time. And when I met her, she already had all our records, which at first I thought was cool. And I went, oh, man, wait, I wonder if she's a stalker. But, you know, it doesn't really matter. I married a stalker. Totally cool. <laughs> That's so cool. Wow. So you have a child bride, then, yeah? <laughs> well, I've been a lot 38 now? Well, they grow up so fast. Speaking of that, it's <laughs> Janice and my 44th anniversary today. Oh, hey. Hey. you know, I was I was going to bring this up, but but we don't never can hear him. But Brian's tenth anniversary is today. Oh, you're kidding! Wow, wow, wow. wow. It's it's anniversary anniversary. Brian. Yeah. Our, our anniversary for what? His uh, wedding anniversary. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations yeah. if you're if you're out there. Brian, congratulations to you and uh, John. You also. Thank you. What would you all say? What would you all say is the legacy of the Partridge family and why it should be remembered? Danny? I'll tell you, I would be, I would have been shocked that when we were doing it, somebody said, really, 50 years from now, you're going to be sitting around a computer. And I just said, what's a computer? And then they said, talking about the Partridge, I thought that was not a real thing. But it is. It's a, it's a, a people care so much. I was out with David Dasney one night, uh, actually on, on tour. And this woman called him and said, I'm David's biggest fan. And she pulled up her dress. And there was a tattoo of David Cassidy's whole face looking young and beautiful. And I said, well, that's great. And now he'll stay young forever. And she said, nope. And she lifted up the other side of the dress and had the six-year-old David Cassidy. So <laughs> a big for that show. Wow. 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 It's crazy. Rick, what do you think? The two things that immediately come to mind, first and foremost, is the music. And then second of all, and I think this is linked to the music, is that when you watch the show, you're, you're literally getting a time capsule. You're getting a slice of American television and American culture that is not found on any other form of artistry in America at that time. The Partridge family had a unique look, a unique style, and a unique sound that is uh, unlike anything else I think that was going on in American t TV or music. Amen. Bruce, what do you think? What is the legacy of the Partridge family in your eyes? I think it was the perfect. I think it was a perfectly cast show. I think it was warm and funny, genuinely funny, uh, still to this day. And uh, you love the characters and you love the music. And there was no real negativity on it. And people miss it. They just, you know, you watch stuff today and it's it's well written and stuff, but it's all blah, you know. I, I can't look at it because it's negative, negative. but uh, yeah, it's just it was the sweetest show. And the people on it were so genuine. And that's why it worked because the cast themselves were so genuine. They just were, they were those people. And uh, I think that's why people love it to this day. They want it back. They clearly want yeah. it back. I agree. We could, use the, we, could, we could use another show like The Partridge Family today. Yeah. Boy, we sure could. I am now too obviously too old for this, but I don't know if it's Warner's Television, somebody was pitching the idea of a new Partridge Family with me in the Rubik and Kincaid part, which <laughs> I would love to have done. And then, as uh, like many other television shows, it went by the wayside. But that was, that was, that was a cool idea. I, like I said, I'm too old now, uh, but I would love it if they did a, a new version yeah. of it. Yeah, that would be great. Henry, Ann, uh, what do you think stood out about the Partridge family um, in terms of its longevity? Go ahead, Ann. You, you first. Well, um, I, well, for one thing, it, it was the trifecta. It was music, 
great. It was good acting. It was great people. And, you know, you opened this show and it said it was the turbulent 60s. And then the Partridge family came around. And it, it really, it's endured because it made so many people happy. And, yeah. you know, how... What what better thing could you hope to achieve than to make people all right. all over the um, yeah. world happy? That's so, so true. Yeah. They they accomplish their goals. Amen. Yeah, yeah. John Henry, how about yeah. you guys? John Henry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the thing about. The thing about the Partridge family and the monkeys, I mean, think of it, they were two shows that had music. Every week they'd have a song. I mean, and they were so wildly popular. So many young girls tuned in. Uh, I mean, so many kids liked it because it was a nice, wholesome family, you know, and Shirley was the mom. So, you know, that was really great. And there were, you know, young kids in there. So young children could identify with that. And then there was the music, you know, and the handsome game. So it was, so the teen poppers, you know, the free teens and teens all love that. And, and I, you know, I got to just say, uh, Gary, and here's Gary. Wait, look, look at Gary's T-shirt here. Hey, Gary. Hey, Gary. Nice. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He, Go ahead. He, he handed me this journal that I had here, and it oh. said uh, September 17th, 1973, and it's about, he says, uh, Dinner at a round table. This is on the ship. Dinner at a round table between David and Susan with Bruce and Dale. Dale was uh, like, uh And then it says later, it says, later, slowly drunk in the dolphin club with various <laughs> movie crew and friends and stuffed with <laughs> Stuffed with six cheese sandwiches. Behind the scenes, of the Every day, family, right? the whole thing, yeah. <laughs> For me, I think the, I mean, the, everybody is spot on as far as I'm concerned. But one of the things that I think Bruce brought this up earlier, um, the family, uh, the show, and this is to the writers. The show tackled a lot of social issues in a way that was palatable to the average person. Um, it wasn't negative. It wasn't positive. It was just a fact. And I, I thought that that was really enlightening. It was one of the first shows that I remember to ever do that. I mean, all in the family attacked issues, but they did it blatantly. Yeah. Part mm -hmm. of approached it a little bit differently. And I think that... Um, I really remember that about the show. When I see it now, um, it still feels exactly the same. I know. Danny, um, how important to you was your relationship with Dave Madden and the others, but especially um, Dave Madden? You can't overstate my relationship with uh, uh, Dave Madden. Uh, I used to go uh, to Dave Madden's cool. This one is so long from a 12 year old kid. And he would take me uh, and my friends his beach house and would be so kind to me. And on the set, we would run our lines together before that. No other grown-ups did that with me, uh, but uh, uh, but Dave Madden, he was just a spectacular guy. And I would say he formed my character, but some people might say that's not a great endorsement. But uh, he <laughs> and he was very kind to me, and I loved him dearly. Very that's funny. so great. Uh, Danny, tell the story I've heard. I just got to hear you tell it one more time about how he taught you to drive. All right, I, I will. It's funny, I was just telling this story to my friend Stacy. Um, <laughs> here's, here's what would happen. He was this is great. a golf cart, right? So I was used to driving this little golf cart, and Dave Madden had this uh, Fiat 124 Spider, I believe, a little cute uh, uh, two-door convertible. And we got up to the top of Malibu Canyon, pointing down. He said, okay, take over. And I had the driver's seat. I was very excited because he had his hand here doing this kind of stuff. He could take over the front, but I couldn't hit the pedals. And all of a sudden, uh, we start going faster and faster. And now I'm starting to freak out. You can hear the tires squealing. And I look up and I go, Dave, take over. And Dave does this. And somebody goes, ah! <laughs> <laughs> And he's a heart attack. 
<laughs> this to the edge, man, because every turn we take, he bashes that. <laughs> I don't know how he was doing. I don't know if he had his hand under the steering wheel, but that was probably one of the scariest nights of my life. Oh my god, that's insane. <laughs> yeah, that's great. You know, I really I wanted to do a tribute to Suzanne Crow here. We lost her way too early in life. And yeah. I had several yeah. questions for Brian. I know they were very close through the years and they did a lot of conventions together. And uh, he has always talked about, um, you know, their sort of special little friendship. Uh, but Rick, I'm wondering, did you did you get to play with them while you were on the set? Did you get to hang out with them at all? No, because for me, I was too young to, to be in school on set. Yeah. So what would typically happen was whenever they weren't working, they would have to get their three hours of school in typically. So when they were in school, I was with my mom and dad because I wasn't of the age to be in school yet. So I would I would interact while we were filming or rehearsing, but I, I there was no interaction other than that because they were typically doing their school. Right. Yeah. You know, I always wondered why they didn't do more episodes about Chris and Tracy. I mean, the Brady Bunch splashed it all around. So, you know, why not pump up a little more Chris and Tracy? What's your thoughts on that? Rick? Oh, I, I agree. And and they the last time I had seen them was at one of the signing events at the uh, in Burbank. And they were both together. And I know they did that a lot together. And I agree with you. I think they they definitely had a chemistry together and, and not only on screen and on the show, but it continued throughout the years where they were always wanting to support and do stuff that was for the Partridge family. Yeah, that's so great. Danny, you know, Shirley Jones has called you several times one of the greatest young actors she ever worked with. One of the one of the two greatest child actors, you and Ron Howard. What's your reaction to that? Ron Howard's a hack. I think because I get that a lot in awards and I think Anna knows the entire B magazine that Danny Bonaduce is the best child actor, Mickey Rooney and Danny Bonaduce. And what it really was, was it was the material. They wrote that part for a grown up and I played it like a grown up. I had the voice of a grown up. And so I'm on all sorts of lists of the greatest child star in the world. And you know what, I'll take that. It was, a, this was, you know, people get really weird about the thing that brought them. People like don't want to admit that they were on happy days or some such thing. Uh, I love the Partridge family. Obviously, uh, Ricky loved the Partridge family. Uh, Bruce couldn't stop coming back to the Partridge family. I, I will take whatever accolade I can get. But again, it's like Ricky and I said, it's all because of the Partridge family. Yeah. Wow, that's fantastic. Uh, I want to pay tribute here to David Cassidy. Um, the man was an underrated uh, musical genius, in my opinion. He had a voice like no other. Uh, we have a beautiful clip from the show here of one of the Partridge Family favorites called Summer Days. Oh, I love this. Yeah, you're going to love this video. Michael, can you roll? Great song. Great song, man. Great song. Great act. Great face. Great hair. Great voice. Man, I, I live in that guy's shadow and it doesn't bother me. <laughs> Danny, we got to talk about this here because I think this is kind of an amazing story. You grew up to go out with him and play with him, and you did stand up, and then later you learned the bass and you appeared on stage. All those things are true. When uh, 1990, I, uh, I ran afoul of the law. Um, no. And David came into my house in Phoenix, Arizona, and things were not going well for me. And he said, listen, I think you're the funniest guy in the world, but you've become the joke. Don't be the joke. And I said, okay. And he said, you know, because you got to get this. You're looking terrible. And I thought, you know, I could beat this guy up. And he said, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you on the bus. We're going to go on the bus. We're going to tour around, and we're going to have a great time. We're going to get you a job. And I said, this, this will be great. And he said, here are the rules, though. Uh, uh, there'll be no drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, or women on the bus. And I said, well, I am not going. And uh, he talked me into it, the country, and he was dead right. I had a job by Philadelphia. 
That's so crazy. And then you got on stage with him and played the bass. Learned the bass to get on stage one with him. I learned one song. I don't remember exactly what, it, what, what song it was, but one of the parts was my tunes. And he was on my radio show in Philly, and uh, it was almost kind of a dare. And it, was, it just mostly came out of something David Cassidy wants me to do, and that's good enough for me. And I took lessons so I could play a, uh, a bass solo on a song from the party. And we ended up on uh, Good Morning America, the Today Show, whatever, and playing bass and guitar with Lester Holt. That couldn't have been more cool. <laughs> oh, man, that is so cool. What an evolution. Bruce, you knew David through the years, too, didn't you? Yeah. Did you yeah, ever work? I adored him. Uh, we, I was meant to record Blood Brothers with uh, him and Petula and Sean, uh, and it didn't work out uh, for various reasons. But uh, having a reunion with him then, it was so great, so much fun. I hadn't seen him in years, but we were really close during the show. I went to his house. He came to my house for dinner. Um, it just, I just adored him. I mean, he was just, you know, everyone has their stuff, but uh, it doesn't matter in the end. He was just a great guy. Just loved him. Yeah. Loved his voice. Yeah. Loved his hair. Damn him. And uh, <laughs> Henry, you stay. Can't, can't say enough about him. You know, so. I, 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 the thing is, I never saw the. I never saw the 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 dark side of him. I never saw it ever. So it's meaningless to me, uh, you know. It's, well, it's yeah. Really good. You and know, Dave was, was a great guy. guy. For two years, and I never, ever saw it either. Never. The guy was a genius in hiding it, I guess, but I don't remember him like that. I remember as being bigger than life and better than all. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's how I remember him too. Hey, Henry, uh, you, you stayed friends with him all through the years and took many pictures of him post Partridge family for decades. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, he always had that face, but I mean, it was a time when he lived in Kentucky and he married that lady and they had horses and he had short kind of blonde, bleach hair, you know, that yeah. was the time. Uh, but basically, I mean, he was dating the whole time. I too never really saw the dark side of him, you know. I mean, that there wasn't really a dark side, I mean, you know. Well, you know, I think they play that crap up all the time. Just I agree. Tabloid edge. You know, David, I always tell everyone David was a man like everybody else. And I do no, he wasn't. Right? <laughs> I said, no, he wasn't. More than, more than everybody else. Yeah. He, was a, he was a fun loving guy. He right? was. Henry he Jones. loved to have fun. He loved the adventure. You know, he was an Aries. And he told me once, he said, You know, you know what it's like to be an Aries? He said, If I see a brick wall in front of me, I put my head down and go for it. <laughs> that was great. Perfect. Ready to go. That's all. I mean, he loved life and he lived it really large. Maybe a little too large at the end, you know. But I think yeah. he had a great life. Yeah. John, yeah. Uh, you worked with him later when you did that and now. And uh, was that the only time that you worked with him? After Partridge Family? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I mean, I, I never got to see David perform until he did a performance here in Branson um, just a year before he passed. And my son and I went to, my our, our oldest son, Greg, and I went to see him. And we went back. Somebody came out to get me in the audience and said, David wants to see you right away. He found out you were here. So we went back there, and he hugged me like I've never been hugged. It was the kindest, kindest thing. And he kept pulling away from me and looking at me and then hugging me again, you know? And then during the show, it was like the John Baylor show. I mean, David talked about me about every other song. That's he, great, he, man. He to sing a song and say, you know, John Baylor is the reason that this, you know, it was just the sweetest, the sweetest, sweetest thing. And then after the show, he was right to his hotel to his model. And it was really sad. It was really, really sad. Um, and one of the guys that traveled with him told me that that's pretty much his M.O. You know, he's okay before the show, but then after the show, he's got to go do his thing, you know. And I knew then that he wasn't going to be around very long, but it just killed me. It broke my heart because I love this kid. I mean, I can remember when the show first started after the pilot and we got called in to do the show. He was 19. I was 29. 
and there was a, a place around the corner from one of the from the studio where we used to record called Lenny's Boot Parlor. It was a little hole in the wall, but everybody shopped there. His clothes were really expensive. I remember taking David to that place and showing him how to dress. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, great. Oh, it's like the paisley shirt and the bell bottom jeans, and yeah, it was really funny. Um, Why do you all think that um, the Brady Bunch uh, stayed in the limelight through the years, and the Partridge Family didn't? Um, you know, I don't get that. <laughs> I'm a little biased, though, Danny. Yeah, I, to be honest with you, I, I don't know. Their show was a huge show. I think one of the main things is we only did 94 episodes, and they did over a hundred. And over 100 is where the money is, as you can do residuals. Uh, but the last time I saw Greg Brady, it was in a celebrity boxing match on Fox. And that boy did not do very well. <laughs> wow. I've, I've heard about that. Yeah, it was, a, it was a nasty for him. But it was fun. It was kind of can you imagine I think Brady? Most people want to do that. He lives, here in Branson. Here. he lives here in Branson now. Yeah, I know. Yeah, are you in Branson right now? Yes, sir. Oh, cool. We, yeah, we yeah, moved yeah. Home. He had a theater for a while, and now he has a home there. Yeah, that's Rick, super awesome. that? we, we communicate once in a while because oh, you? Whenever they recorded, we did all the voices. So, ah, cool. Uh, Rick, what are your thoughts on that? Well, Brady versus um, Brady. Brady. Why? I honestly don't know, but it is something that I've encountered more often, where people will say. They remember the you know the Brady Bunch more than they remember Partridge Family. And I've had some people ask me if I was Oliver. Um, <laughs> I had people and, ask me that about you too. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and I I honestly I don't know other than I think Danny's point is pretty pretty accurate in the fact that they had more episodes and which also put them into a place of more reruns. And they stayed, I think they stayed in rerun for a longer period of time, which kept them in the national consciousness a bit longer. Hey, yeah. real quick, uh, let's not wait another 50 years again. I, I got, what are we, two hours into this already? I got to run <laughs> I, Man, oh, you look so good. This is so exciting. It's wonderful. Oh, this is good. Every year. They what did. are you, um, what are you all doing today, uh, Bruce? Uh, I'm sitting here doing the show. Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I've been doing a monthly cabaret series in LA uh, for 10 years uh, every month. Uh, and we've been doing them online uh, since that all stopped uh, live stuff and uh, having a blast. And I write every day. And, oh, that's great. And Rick, how about you? And I, and I have a record label. You know, I have a record, successful record label. We do a lot of soundtracks and shows and stuff. Rick, how about you? Yeah, I, I do uh, two YouTube channels, primarily one called Our Stupid Reactions, which is a reaction channel that focuses primarily on artistry from all over India and also continue acting. Oh, great. Henry? Uh, well, I'm still taking pictures. I take pictures every day, not so much of people because we're not together, but, uh, you know, pictures around the house, pictures on the TV screen, whatever. I photograph stuff I see all day long, and um, I do a lot of Zoom interviews. This is my second one today. Wow, no kidding. So, yeah, and how about you? Huh? Uh, Anne, how about you? What do you do today? Well, um, I retired uh, in 2016. Um, I, once I left uh, the magazine writing business, I did all kinds of other things. My best job being uh, a mom to my two sons um, and and a full-time mom. So it was, that was the most fun of my life. And then this crazy internet thing, you know, crazy. I mean, I found out my name was in Google and uh, that made, that led me to start a blog and that led me to think gee if i can write those pieces i can write a book and so now i promote my book meow my groovy life with tiger beats teen idol oh, that is great and i love that book and i'm just and they write me and tell me they really enjoyed you know just looking back on those times Oh, that's fantastic. John, how about you? You're the only one we haven't talked to here. Well, uh, when I found out I had a Wikipedia page, I knew I had made it. 
Um, <laughs> after we moved to Branson, I was the uh, musical director for the Lawrence Welk Show. I married a Janet Lennon of the Lennon Sisters, as some of you may know. And um, they're pretty much retired now, or they're talking about it. They've been talking about it for 40 years. But uh, wow. I, the, most of the writing I've done, I've done for the sisters uh, over the last yeah, 30 or 40 years. And I don't write much anymore. I'm kind of semi-retired. Um, had a heart attack two months ago, and um, and I'm feeling great. Uh, everything's fine. Everything's working. No damage to the heart, so I'm happy about that. Oh, yeah. that's wonderful. Kind of, you know, I just hate to use the R word. My wife always says, can't you just say retired in your <laughs> life? And I said, no. Yeah. I am. Well, you know, you guys, this has been a pleasure. Uh, I can't tell you how much fun this has been. Um, I'm sorry we lost our two drummers. Poor Brian. I hope he gets yeah. to uh, watch it at least on his 10-year <laughs> anniversary. <laughs> and uh, Danny, wherever you are out there, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, all of you. Uh, thank, thank you, Johnny Ray. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you for putting this together. Yeah. Oh, thank you, guys. Thank you so much. This has been hey. a pleasure. Hey, Rick, get a hold of me. I will. Yes. Oh, you're yes. talking to Rick. And Danny, too. I want to talk to Danny. All right. And Johnny, Johnny, thank you for this. Oh man, Rick, that is so nice of you. Thank you. Seriously, this this is the book about the Partridge family. It is. Oh, right. Family Bible. Oh, yeah. Rick, thank you. Thank you all so okay. much. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, Bye everybody. Stay Bye, happy. Henry. Bye. <laughs> Come on, get happy. One, two, three, four. It has been such a pleasure, and I'm so thrilled that you all joined us tonight. Uh, what a trip down memory lane. Uh, thanks to all of you that made this show possible. Um, repeating again, I'm not sure I was on there when the clip was playing, but I, I'm going to repeat it again. Thank you to Michael Pomerico, Joe Pomerico, uh, Donnie Axman, our good friend, uh, Danny, Jeremy, Brian, Shirley, Ricky, uh, Bruce, Henry, Anne, this was such a pleasure. And to all of the Facebook groups out there and to all of the fans who supported this, I thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart. Uh, so uh, let's all stay on the bus together, huh? Come on, get happy. Good night.